Welcome to Operator Syndrome. Uh, we're back. Steve and I were talking about rules of engagement in the last episode. Um, we got a little off, tra- off track, but I think, um, I think it was worthwhile. So we, we got into the topic, rules of engagement, laws of armed conflict, and then we kind of took sort of a, a historical, biblical sort of look at it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Thought, I thought that was of value. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to come, we're going to go back to where we had intended on, on heading with it, which is talking about uh, some use cases, some, some fairly, um, uh, I was about to say popular use, but that's not quite the uh, well-known, well-known incidents or well-known situations that folks right. have been involved in. And then we're just going to talk through, you know, our perspective, having been uh, in, in and around similar situations or, or been in a position where that could have been us and and talk about what some of the implications are we'll do disclaimer up front we're not making judgments on we're not monday morning quarterbacking what anyone has ever done right. uh, we we weren't there it, when you're in the moment uh, oftentimes you're you're reacting and you're not really thinking through it um you're you're using your training and, and yeah. your personal experiences to make a value judgment and it's you know we're not in a position to to second guess those calls so that's not what we're doing um, yeah. we're just talking about um really sort of dissecting how um how there may be things written in policy you know there may be things printed on paper and how sometimes and, and to see how those compare against what real life is like which is very messy and, and you know a lot of gray area so we'll kick it off to steve to yeah. get started yeah, and uh, just to uh, bolster that point, um, it's one thing to sit here on a nice air-conditioned study in my peaceful repose in the country and think critically about decisions that have been made that are made under duress and pressure and all kinds of what they call the fog of war, where man things just unfold and it's like it's your training you're just reacting almost um very emotional very intense so uh, just underscore that man it, some of the situations we might be talk well we will be talking about were just incredibly stressful over the top situations so you know nobody thinks carefully and clearly in under those circumstances it's just ridiculously hard so yeah well, I w- wanted to start out with talking about um uh <clears throat> get, just get into some specific ROEs. Uh the first is w- one of the most famous um I don't know what you'd call it, uh, tragedies, um debacles, uh messy situations that happened in Somalia in the early 90s. Um we had what was going on over there was, and it's still, as far as I'm, I haven't checked the CIA fact book lately, but I think for a couple decades, it's been ruled an anarchy. Um, there, there is no legitimate government. It's a bunch of warlords who, um, who are just vying for power. Um, so it's kind of the law of the jungle. And that was the case in the episode we want to talk about, which is famously called Black Hawk Down, which they made a movie about. Um, Mark Bowden, I think is his name, wrote a book about it. Um, so <clears throat> really sticky situation. I thought before I, I, I'll just, um, because Patrick is much more plugged into the Ranger side of the world and culture and was even in the same company that was over there. Um, and he was years later, but those, that episode lives big time, just like some of the ones in the SEAL community, like Operation Red Wings, the killing of Bin Laden, the downing of Extortion 17. Those things are just like, they become part of almost mythological on some level, um, but really, really did happen. So um, let me read these rules of engagement because they're specific. We talked about standing rules of engagement that kind of apply all the time, peacetime or wartime of general rules of conduct for all soldiers and sailors. And then you have specific ROEs, um, which are connected with a particular mission set. Um, so 
this is for this this is for what i'm reading is for these were the roes for the joint task force for somalia relief operation ground forces rules of engagement uh what we were doing there um was the un uh, the united nations was um delivering food and 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 water to these areas that there was there was a wide starvation going on in Somalia at the time because the the warlords were hoarding all of their goods and services and you know the common people were to, were literally starving to death it was it was a real outrage um, so the UN was there United Nations were there um, providing relief uh, um, supplies well. <clears throat> A lot of stuff happened, but they got fired upon several times by these warlords. Uh, and so the United States, it was under the Clinton administration at the time, they sent rangers and the Army National Mission Unit um, and um, some others. Uh, I don't know who all was there, but I know that it was Army, uh, mostly Army. Um, there might have been some Marines. I, I, can't rem I can't recall, but we're going to be talking about the Army side of it. So... They were there in a in a sort of um, kind of almost like a law enforcement capacity. They were mo the troops were there mostly to, um, well, they were looking for bad guys. They were looking for terrorists that we we that were there, um, and some of these warlords were uh, bad actors. They were involved in all kinds of drugs and arms, all kinds of illegal in the eyes of the international community illegal activities, and it's still a mess over there. <laughs> I mean. If you ever want to see an incredible account of 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 an attack, it's the DJ Shipley episode on Sean Ryan's podcast. About over a little over two hours in, he he talks about a mission they did, and it messed. Um, uh, it was bad. It was a bad situation, but same area. Um, so here 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 were the rules of engagement, and um, and then I'll, I'll maybe kick it to Patrick. Um. Nothing in these rules of engagement limits your right to take appropriate action to defend yourself and your unit. Now, that's kind of like one of the standing all overarching ones. A, you have the right to use force to defend yourself against attacks or threats of attack. Hostile fire may be returned effectively and promptly to stop a hostile act. C, when U.S. forces are attacked by unarmed hostile elements, mobs and or rioters u.s forces should use their minimum force necessary under the circumstances and professional to the threat and proportional sorry to the threat you d you may not seize the property of others to accomplish your mission e detention of civilians is authorized for security reasons or in self-defense and then uh, a, a sort of a, a footnote remember Number one, the United States is not at war. Number two, treat all persons with dignity and respect. Three, use minimum force to carry out mission the mission. And number four, always be prepared to act in self-defense. So those were the ROEs for the Joint Task Force there in Somalia, uh, in Mogadishu. Uh, what, what happened, just really briefly, is... Um, the National Mission Unit there was sent to capture, um, a, 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 let's just call him a bad guy. They, they had intel that he was in a certain place, and um, they sent they sent a blocking force of rangers, as is a, a very common use of rangers or a larger force that can cordon off uh, a block or two or whatever. But th this case, I think it was a block, a building. Um, and they flew in on Blackhawks. The National Mission Unit was, as usual, as typically is the case, was on Little Birds. Those are smaller helicopters with uh, seats on the outside, outboard, and and the guys sit buckled in. And they can th these Little Birds can just like land on a rooftop, and the guys can just jump off real quick. Um, the assault force that is. And the Rangers were being flown in on Blackhawks. That's uh, for our civilian listeners. Uh, it's called a UH-60. It's a a real common Sikorsky mo uh, model helicopter that we use a lot. It's probably the, one of the workhorses of of our Hilo platforms. <clears throat> so they went in, and what happened was there was all the signaling that started to happen. The Somalis 
started the the bad Somali, the bad Somalis, the the ones who were on the uh, the bad end of the spectrum, started signaling to each other that there was a force coming in, and word spread. And long story short, a Black Hawk was two Black Hawks were shot down, but the first one went down, which created an incredible scene because they had to now take a bunch of guys and secure the crash site, try to rescue whoever was alive. Um, and then in the course of things, another Black Hawk went down and this, the one of the looking back on it, one of the big problems was it was a daytime. It's much harder to shoot a helicopter with a, a rocket propelled grenade in, in at night. I mean, not that it can't, it has been done, uh, but it's harder to shoot, to shoot a, a bird at night because it's harder to see where it is. Anyway, this is broad daylight as I understand it. Um, all accounts I've ever saw. And so a second one went down and then now you got to secure that crash site. So it, it just became this big mess and a big fight. A lot of guys got killed. Um, a lot of guys got hurt. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. So I, I'll throw it to Patrick because he, uh, as I said, rubbed shoulders with a lot of the guys and even maybe I think some of the guys that were on that mission, right? The... Well, we had... Um... By the time I got to Bico 375, um, I mean, o operationally, there were none of those, those guys were, were, weren't around. Okay. Um, with the exception of a few uh, senior NCOs um, who had been pretty, who had been young guys on that mission and then right. who ended up making it a career and stuck around. Um, and for the ones that did come back around, I think one of them had even like left, left the service and then ended up coming back in for, you know, for the Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, but a lot of those guys had, had aged out basically every four ish years, mm -hmm. first term contracts. You, it's like, it's like a whole new place, but, um, but yeah, I, I somehow ended up in, in Bico, um, I was kind of excited to go to the company that had gone that had participated in that. Um, I, I knew about it. Black Hawk Down came out in 03, I think. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. About then, so, um, so I, I was well aware, <laughs> well aware of it. And um, you know, when I got there, when I got there, there wasn't a lot. We didn't talk about it all that much. And if I sit here now and think back to my time we never sat around talking about somalia yeah. the the incident was obviously around because uh, a big thing we do is is honor the dead so like if you go into to Bico's, you know if you go to the i don't even know what you call it anymore go to the front office right of the company like we've got everyone's picture of yeah. of, of who passed and there are you know, there are plaques and photos and, and there's some uh, uh, artifacts up. And if you go to the battalion headquarters, I think they got some bigger stuff there. Um, so it was around. It was kind of like this looming thing. Um, but we never really talked about it all that much. Um, maybe if some of the guys who were there were around at the time, maybe we'd ask questions, talk about it. But um, but we were also busy dealing with our own problems as well, <laughs> as, well yeah. as well. So, and that was of a different time, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, for those guys, you know, what I'm aware and, and you and I talked about before this, same as you, I, I read the books, <laughs> watched the movie, uh, watched the movie about the movies, documentaries about, yeah. about the movie documentaries about what happened. So I, you know, I've, I've heard different perspectives, uh, and heard from, you know, through the documentaries, the perspective of some of the, the guys that were there, you know, from a rules of engagement perspective, um, they'd gone out a few times. They'd gone out on raids a few times before then. Hmm. Um, I think they'd been in country a couple months at that point. Um, I think they usually went out at night. Like you said, usually they went out at night, but it was, I don't think it was uncommon. They did go out during the day a couple of times. And, um, you know, in terms of, of you know contact enemy contact uh it seemed like from what what i've read heard that 
getting <clears throat> sporadic, you know, pot shots wasn't uncommon. Yeah. You know, like you said, uh, Somalia and Mogadishu specifically, it's it, at the time it's it was a failed state. So this was not this was an area full of weapons. Yeah. Um, full of people on drugs. Yeah. Uh, which is something the movie will talk about and the books will talk about. Yeah. Culturally, at least at the time, you know, there was this sort of uh, there's a, a, a indigenous plant that gave. Um, I was about to say psychedelic. I don't know. That's quite. I think they compared it kind of like cocaine. Like sort I of think it was cocaine. Yeah, like a, like, like an amphetamine. Like an upper, it's yeah, called amphetamine. cot. Yeah, cot. Yeah. So so um, <clears throat> so you got guns. You got drugs. You got nothing to do. You know, you don't have an uh, any an economy to speak of. You don't have jobs to speak of. Um, it is tribal warfare, so yeah. it's not a common. Oh, oh, the Americans are over there. Put the AK around the corner and squeeze off a couple of shots. Yeah. And then go about your day like it was yeah, nothing. Yeah, exactly. So, so that was the environment that 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 the the strike force was dealing with. They were, um, I guess, up until that point, somewhat becoming desensitized by it. And mm. I've seen that. I've experienced that um, when you're a new guy, and when I was deployed overseas to Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, yeah, people would shoot pot shots at you, and at first. It's concerning, but after a while, you do kind of, you do to some extent get used to it. And there's a scene in the movie where they describe the differences, how you can kind of tell the difference between something that's close and at you and something that's just sort of in the general area. Um, yeah. And you do become aware of what the difference is. Yeah. Uh, so um, for those things that don't, that don't appear to be right at you, you're not happy about it. You're aware of it. You're not complacent about it, and I and I wouldn't say that these guys at all got complacent around that, but a little desensitized yeah. to to what to what that danger represented. And on the and on the raid in question, they go in during the day. Um, uh, the movie. This is the part I don't know. So here's where you can turn off turn off this episode because we're just guessing at this point. <laughs> but I suspect the movie kind of paints the picture like. The fire was up before before birds started going down, before people started getting hurt. And maybe that was true because yeah. um, that strike force was targeting a bunch of high level leaders who uh, were leading, uh, you know, their own sort of um, <clears throat> small armies, militias. Right. And so it, it would make sense that, hey, the boss is in that building and the Americans yeah. are going to go get him. So let's shoot at him. So perhaps the fire was up before they yeah. started going down. But what I can what I can pretty much guarantee is as soon as birds started going down, that's really going to get the enemy's like um uh, motivation up, right? Like word's going to spread pretty quickly. Hey, we shot down uh, an American bird. Like let's go. Let's go join in. It's going to get people right. involved. So, um what's what's really not in dispute is that is that it became a big thing. Um the strike force uh, had to deal with um, uh, multiple crash sites that they had to get to isolated crash sites. Um, the the population, uh, armed folks and unarmed yeah. folks. Yeah, you know because you've got the you got the you got the fighters who are looking to get some shots in on the Americans, and then you've got regular people going about their day. But there's also a group of folks who also don't like the Americans, but right. aren't necessarily interested in shooting them they're just yeah. interested in in seeing the americans you know get get what they believe is is owed to them yeah, so there's right. that kind of there's that element too right so there's a spectrum of of people <clears throat> who, who have hostile intentions all the way from people actively shooting to people who are just trying to go about their business who are just stuck in their homes during this yeah so um the strike force is having to deal with that and um and the crowds were large. That's the other thing. So you've got you've got people engaging you individually, but intermixed with yeah. this spectrum of folks, and they're all on top of each other. They're yeah. all right in the same area. Um, so that's where the rules of engagement, as you as you were reading them, um, again, it's got the basic part in there. If you feel like if you feel like you're at, at, uh, in danger, or the rest of the force is in danger, you have the right um the right to defend yourselves but it's more complicated whenever you're dealing with 
um, you know, that specific situation. In some sense, if you were in trenches, right, you know, opposite trenches and everyone's wearing uniforms, that's a little easier to deal with than right. what these guys had to confront. Yeah. And to, to throw in one of the dilemmas for the ROEs, I'm not going to reread the, the, the rules of engagement I just read, but one of them was be especially careful about civilians, mm -hmm. um, minimum force, that kind of stuff. Well, if the movie, I think it was, I've heard other people say that was probably other military guys that I know. That's probably the, one of the best war movies ever as far as realism and the fog of war and how things just are so fluid. Um, but you know, there were, there were, there were teenagers coming running and throwing rocks and grabbing sticks and in these mobs that it just becomes so dizzying. I mean, you're of course the bottom, at the end of the day, you, you have the right to defend yourself, no matter who it is, if you feel you're being attacked and targeted directly, but just crowds and crowds of people, yeah, they were at, and one thing I failed to mention that they were after a warlord named Muhammad Farah Adi, who was the leading, like, warlord at the time, and I think they were going after one of his generals, who knew knew his whereabouts or was high up there involved with him. But um, but yeah, right. what a mess. I also know too. I, I didn't mention this earlier. I knew uh, three or four seals who were there. Um, we, we had some snipers there and they got, they actually shot some people at different, I don't know what the details were. It, I don't know if it was related to the Black Hawk Down episode, but there were some kills uh, made over there. So there, it was a hostile, hostile environment. <clears throat> yeah, it was a tough one. Again, you know, for us, it, it, didn't really come up and i and i certainly i was never in a situation that 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 could have you know that could have gotten to that level so yeah. um i'm thankful for that well there's another uh episode that we were that was of interest well because they also made a movie about it uh, which is um you can say it a couple ways the lone survivor is probably the most popular at least popular by being known quantity um of what happened to a four-man recon team seal reconnaissance team uh that got compromised and three out of the four were killed um marcus latrell was the lone survivor um they named it that because of him and because he's from texas uh and then a QRF quick reaction force that was sent in to help try to get well try to help at the time it, this all was going down and um that bird was shot down um operation red wings um which is also a pretty famous incident um which was the at the time it was the one before extortion 17 um i think it was 05 but it was the largest at that time mass casualty in afghanistan um <clears throat> so what happened was I knocked some stuff over. Sorry. Yeah. What happened was um they uh they were sent in to recon to look for this guy, Ahmad Shah, I believe was his name, terrorist, uh Taliban member who was was he was re directly responsible for a bunch of Marines losing their lives um in attacks. Um and so they were they were going in there to to spot him to 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 ID him and then call in a larger force to assault him and his his whoever he was with. But it turned out that, and this is this is something that it, soldiers just pull their hair out at all the time, and that's bad intel. I don't know what it is, but that's one of our biggest Achilles heels is having the wrong intelligence, just meaning the wrong specific information about a target where they are how many there are things like that there were there were over a hundred taliban hardened war, war fighters in, in this village they said there was only like 10 right which is formidable enough if you've got people who are experienced but just 
it ended up being a whole lot. <clears throat> so the team was inserted in a mountainous region and they were to patrol in a four man recon team and um, get eyes on the sky and then report back. Okay. So a number of things started to go South. The most important in my opinion was they lost comms. They, they had no, because of the mountains and because of the, the ravines and everything, they couldn't use secure comms to get, to be in touch with the headquarters element back at, I think it was Bagram. And I think that's where the task force was located at for this particular mission. And, um, then <laughs> they're in the middle of these hills and it's really some of the most, um, difficult terrain that there is from what I've heard. I've never been there, but I've talked to a lot of people who have, and it's just really hardcore terrain. Uh, and so they couldn't get comms. And then they're, they, they're in a, they're in a perimeter, uh, deciding what to do and to get eyes on the sky. And lo and behold, um, three goat herds came by and just literally like almost walked right over top of them and there there was no way they they detained them they you know got a hold of them and they were unarmed but they had a radio with them and what is most likely talking i talked to a commander who was in the talk at Buckram, a seal uh I, I met years later when i was at seal team 18 doing chaplain duty and um <clears throat> so he gave me some inside scoop on it but uh, they they um, they they believe in retrospect and looking back at the situation that this they weren't just goat herds they were out looking for American forces and as as like a recon element that you'd say they knew better than to carry weapons because if they had weapons then we could fire on them they would be enemy combatants according to the ROEs uh, so they detain these, these three goat herds. And um, then a discussion came up, right? They knew if they let these guys go, they were going to just sprint down the mountain to the village and let the people know, Hey, we've got Americans up here. Let's go get them. And they had vehicles. They, they, they knew the roads. They had all the advantages of knowing the terrain. And they're, I mean, really those Afghan fighters, they are really skilled in the, in the, Kid negotiating those mountainous hills uh and we're we're also loaded down and heavier and and, and everything so anyway so the, the, the dilemma was okay we we can't okay what do we do with these guys do we kill them because we know they're on the bad side or at least they were 99 percent sure because uh, they were from the same village they were they were targeting um <clears throat> where Shaw was located. Do we kill him? Well, if we do that, we could go, we could face war crimes uh, and go to, go to prison because they couldn't prove that they were enemy fighters. Um, or do we let them go? And if we let them go, we're going to have Taliban raining down on us faster than we can probably respond because they had already seen that there were a lot more Taliban than what the intel told them. So that was their dilemma, what to do. To commit something that is, it's right on the, I mean, it, it's, I could see why they would be tempted to to make that call. But you can't do it. You can't cross that line. If that's the ROE, it, and, and these people weren't, they couldn't claim self-defense necessarily. They weren't under attack. They had them in their custody zip tied them or something they were not going anywhere so kill them or let them go it's a tough choice now they decided to let them go and we know what happens or if you've seen the movie uh, they were attacked and four of the three out of the four seals were killed in a really fierce firefight i think they killed in the neighborhood of over 40 taliban <laughs> the, the four guys now, that's a lot um whether that is an accurate count i don't know but uh, that's what I have been told. Um, there, what myself and 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 this commander I talked to, who was there at the talk, he wasn't in the field, but he was he was in the uh, control element. 
and my other a couple friends of mine who who were seals um and served later than me they were in iraq and afghanistan what i my first question was this and i'm like i say we are not faulting anybody these four guys were particularly junior rank guys they were they were not nearly as experienced as uh a, a lot of later in iraq and afghanistan um, and it was early on in the war. Uh, it it was, yeah, relatively early on in the war. The one in charge who got the Congressional Medal of Honor, um, Michael Murphy, uh, was a lieutenant. And I looked at his, I actually went, when I was at Chaplain Basic School, they, they were dedicating a brand new swimming pool uh, facility. And they named it the Michael, I think it P or Michael T. Murphy a combat training tank or something on Newport Naval Base. And I put a special request in. I was in school at the time. I was in Chaplick Basic, but obviously I'm a member of the community. And I, I put a special request to go attend it because it's meaningful to me and to my community. And they they let me. They let me get out of class that day and go watch this dedication. And I met uh, Murphy's parents who were there and some other team guys who were there for it. Um, but anyway... He was at the service, uh, this, well, dedication slash kind of like a memorial because it was about him. Uh, they had his picture, of course, in his dress blues um, up on the somewhere I, I, I remember prominently displayed. And I took one look and I was like, whoa, his most recent photo, the, the last one they had of him in his blues. He just had, he says, National Defense Ribbon his expert pistol and expert rifle ribbon that's it and i mean that's not a lot of experience you can kind of tell how much experience somebody has by you know what what they're wearing not, maybe not 100 percent the case but pretty well so i was just thinking to myself wow how junior he was and he was in control so i mean he was in charge of that operation and i'm uh, it just struck me that how little experience that they had had in the field but anyway my first question was well, why didn't they not let those goat, goat herds go? Keep them with them. Of course, you're not going to hurt them, but you're going to not let them go. You're going to detain them, okay? And then get out of Dodge, Get try to get comms, and just uh, abort. Just get out of there. Um, and then when you get comms and when you get an extraction, then let the guys go or take them to where you found them and drop them off, but don't, you're not going to hurt them. It, it seems to me like that would be the move to make. Um, a lot of times I think, and again, I'm not pointing my fingers, man. I, I would have been freaking out too, if I was in that situation. Uh, but there's, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, what's called an informal fallacy in logic. Um, they have formal fallacies and informal fallacies. The informal fallacies are what usually get people in trouble because it's, lapses in critical thinking um and one of those is called the fallacy of the false dilemma it's also called the either or fallacy either it's this or it's that well it's a fallacy because many times in a complex situation there are numerous uh possibilities not just two um this gets used so much it drives me crazy in religion and politics uh, those are the two most common areas where fallacies arise because you're committed to an ideology or a cause. So you demonize the other side when it's usually way more complicated, way more complex, a lot of gray. Um, and people get trapped into thinking, well, either I've got to do this or I've got to do that. That, And so I just never under, I and, and, and other guys who I talked to said the same thing. They're like, yeah, <laughs> looking back on it. Why not? I mean, does, does that what do you think patrick as a, as an operator um well i can't i can't claim the according to army rules i can't claim the term operator and uh not interested uh, in that. <laughs> that's right I, you're not I, an I, operator i'm, I'm, a, I'm a range I'm an ex ranger but yeah, yeah. um okay yeah I, I i sort of have to begin with you know one call out now it's been many years since that incident and since the book came out and we we do kind of have to acknowledge that um there's been a, a lot of information out about that incident since that, um, that uh, what's right? What's right? What's right? Where does that that uh, disputes 
some 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 of the, the characterization of yeah. of enemy forces and 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 some of and some of that kind of stuff the the base sequence of events it doesn't seem like many folks have many gripes with but yeah um, uh, um, and so we'll we'll just put that out there uh, in terms of like the dilemma you know I one of the things I thought was interesting is that in the Gulf War I believe there was a, a relatively famous in, incident where an SAS reconnaissance element was compromised and almost a very similar situation, right? Was it, they made a movie as like yeah. Bravo two zero or something like yeah, that. And I, I believe, it. and I, and listen, I don't know anything about that. So I actually, I'm going to turn it back to you to ask what you'd heard about it. Cause you would have been in the special operations community at the same time. Yeah. I believe for them, it was a child, a, a clear yeah. child, yeah, that stumbled on their hide site, which yeah. was a sh- shitty situation because they're out in the middle of a flat desert. They did what they could, um, and they're rel- pretty experienced folks. It's the SAS, yeah. Um, but they and and that's almost exactly the situation that um, uh, that that the Operation Red Wings sort of would would end up sort of telling as well as, as what happened to them. Um, do you recall that mm-hmm. incident? And or anything yeah. about that? I recall it. It was a big dilemma. It was going around what had happened to those guys getting compromised. But I I don't know what the specifics were yeah. about what they what they did in return. Um, and I think and according to the story, like uh, one or two of them got captured and ended up getting like horrifically tortured uh, yeah. by the Iraqi military. But how much of that's true? I don't know. But yeah. that's just something. That's just a light bulb moment I had just now. Sort of like that's yeah. sort of the same exact thing um but yeah uh, the same thing as you i mean i I had the benefit of i showed up about around 2005 um pulling folks off target would have been a to be blunt a no-brainer to us later in the war i will say i never went out with four guys Yeah. yeah that's also a a criticism of the planning of that operation that i'm not making i'm just saying that that's yeah. been out there um yeah. and, and in fairly formal formal venues that's been a criticism of the planning of that meeting why were there four guys yeah. um i i do believe they packed it up after they got compromised so that is that all makes sense they're doing a reconnaissance that makes sense, yeah. they got compromised they left it's it's how did the guys how did the guys get away um <clears throat> you say you let them go and also, and I think you brought this up too, which is, and I'm interested, and we're run, rapidly running out of time here, but maybe we'll fit it in real quick. This idea that there was some sort of debate or yeah. vote. You had, a, you had a lieutenant, an officer in the military. This is the military, but the SEALs have a unique yeah. culture. You've described yeah. it yourself. Sometimes it gets you all in trouble. How yeah. realistic do you think it is that an SDV team of four guys, they debate that the lieutenant doesn't take charge and decide what it is they do I, that's one thing i want to hear yeah i i that that to me rings true uh it's very collaborative in the teams much more so than the army from what i know um i mean we're it goes back to buzz we really feel more like we're peers um and we still have rank and we still have to follow the the chain of command and all that but it it really is a case where I could see a discussion like that happening. I mean, my lieutenant would call myself and my spotter in in the Gulf War and say, "All right, how are we going to do this?" And we would say, "Here's what we think." Now he could override us if he didn't like something, but we'd say, "This is what we're going to do, and these are the weapons we're going to use, and this is how we're going to plan it." And he goes, "All right, do it, plan it." So there think, was a lot. Yeah, there was I a think, lot. Of, mm-hmm. And the movie I think did show that. The movie did, yeah. and I don't know if yeah. the story does. Uh, but but okay. I don't know. There's I wasn't nothing. there. So absolutely. It, 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 it's possible. It, it, like a discussion like that is possible in my mind for a bunch of SEALs. There you go. From a SEAL's mouth. All right. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you in the next one. See you. Cheers.